If you remember, in 2010, Marina Abramovich presented an amazing sort of groundbreaking historical exhibition at MoMA Museum in New York, which was called The Artist is Present. So if we rephrase this a little bit, I would have called this show The Artist is Absent. There is no artist here um, or a body of any artist, whereas all of the visitors become the artists. And that is quite important for me because what I'm trying to achieve is like to um, create a collective body of performance art. I tend to use my own body and um, interact with the bodies of the other people. Actually, this show talks a lot about body and bodies as in a medium, as in a, um, a living universe, as in something that is required to make these objects, the sculptures. I really think that they look cute if you look at them from a distance, but the closer you get to them and then they maintain the role of design or an object that you can look at. But the closer you get to them, the more awkward they get. And that's what I want from them at the end of the day, because like at the moment of an interaction that a visitor's body performs with the sculpture, at this very point, they become sculptures. I really think that this is something we know very little about, and there is a lot to explore. And I also think that there is so much pain around us, and there is so much suffering, that if we manage to uh, build a bit of a situation that would help heal, contemplate, experience compassion, experience other people's needs, that's what is a pure goal of the show. I think art um, and visual art and museum environment are so much more complex than what we think about them in theory or in practice when we come and experience museums. I believe there is a lot for us to explore and I'm positive that we have quite a, quite a lot of beautiful or not so beautiful things to discover in the future. I assume um, many people come to museums knowing by default there is no touching involved. I really cherish my memories of my amazing mentor and teacher, Robert Wilson. Um, a fantastic American theater opera director, visual artist. Bob has a collection of um, beautiful ancient art, which is located at his watermill center um, um, in the Hamptons. Um, so when he welcomes visitors to explore this collection with him, he always touches them, he kisses them, he caresses them. And I think that is, I mean, of course we cannot apply this to all possible museums <laughs> to all possible especially ancient art if you know 20 people touch it well but these works are here to be touched and this is a boundary an important boundary which i'm trying to cancel through this and make sure that people and the artwork is the same thing your body the moment you interact with anti furniture becomes a body of art a performance body the moment you get into a sculpture the moment you interact with it, you become one. There is no more frontier. There is no more separation. And the moment what you mentioned about the moment of you looking inwards is something that is critically important for this work because the moment you start to observe your inner self, whatever, blah, 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 inner child. I, I, don't, I don't use this terrible, dangerous words, but I think that, and also meditation is very speculative, like so many people talk about it and I mean, 
I'm not trying to say I know everything about the pure meditation and other people don't, but I'm trying to say that it is a dangerous ground and um, we should be very careful about using these words. So when, when, when we say mantra, we as in like my wonderful invigilators, when we tell people, okay, now you're going to be giving a mantra, we whisper this mantra into your ear. This is all about intimacy because art is a very intimate process. It could be compared easily to anything as in like sensual contact it's caressing other people it's kissing them it's it could be easily compared to sexual interactions because what we carry away with us when we're going home from any museums or galleries any art spaces is much heavier and much more significant than what we feel about it and many of the things if only we see them if only we allow them to enter our space these things would remain with us forever, maybe. These things would pretty much make a huge sense in our decision-making processes, in our... And that is why the phobias are so important, because our entire world is made of phobias. So I wake up with a phobia and I go to bed with another one. These works are here to slightly tiny help us, because all of the phobias are here. And the moment we stop thinking about our fears and start thinking about other things there are very few of them in our life and the process is completely irreversible but like i'm i'm saying like thinking about phobias and taking a good care of them so i think that taking good care of your phobia is like to completely abandon it and pretend it doesn't exist these works these machines as i tend to call them are here to help this So there is theater and theater, okay? Um, the personal theater is a, is a word, is a wording added to my text by the museum's curators. I, I totally disagree. I don't think this, is, this has anything to do with the theater. Theater is artificial. It can be beautiful. It can be amazing. It can be powerful. It can be mind blowing. But what we have here has nothing to do with the theater. This is life. A difference between performance art and theater is that a theatrical actor comes to work. They have their home, they have their fridge, they have their mortgage, they have their children. Then they come to work, they get on stage, they perform. They um, do this probably at the age of, at the edge of their possibilities, etc. But at the end of the day, they do this and they're being paid for it. Performance artists can die any moment. Theater actors also can die, but anyone of us can die any moment. But like theater actors, there are lots of safety and security sort of labor rules and whatever. So they're all secured, whereas performance artists, anything can happen any moment. Like there is no fridge, there is no mortgage. There is just life that becomes a pure artwork at the end of the day, if only this artist does the serious stuff. So... I don't think comparing this to theater makes any sense because like theater is something where you kind of put another face on top of your own one and here you just remove as many masks as possible and keep it bare and keep it completely exposed, no, overexposed. I think a lot of architecture is anti-architecture already. So many architects do things for their own use and not for the use of the people, which is beautiful at, you know, at some point. I don't know how, what do you feel about Oscar Niemeyer, but Oscar Niemeyer's museums, for example, which are spread all across Brazil and even in some other countries, these museums are, ooh, <laughs> imagine a space where the ceilings are two meters tall. And then you should somehow place an artwork there. And it could be a painting which is even larger than this. And um, a lot of architects who work with exhibition architecture suffer a lot using Oscar Niemeyer's museums. Because those museums are designed for Oscar Niemeyer's beautiful artistic ambitions and have nothing to do with the needs of a particular space, nothing to do with utilitarian um, requirements and whatsoever. So... 
Zaha Hadid. I mean, you know it much better than I do. And like, let's just don't go into this and let's don't break those beautiful myths and legends about most amazing architects doing huge things for humanity. I mean, I think that anything anti goes well until the moment it steps onto people's own territory and sort of makes them not being so satisfied with because architecture is not necessarily just art architecture has a lot of utilitarian part to it and then what do we think of Le Corbusier and what do we think of I don't know the Soviet constructivism where you build a house for a thousand people and and the cells versus apartments have only a toilet the rest should be communal so you go to communal shower you go to communal dining room you cook in groups and then at the end of the day they want you to sleep as a part of a thousand people group and this thousand people is sleeping in the communal dormitory where there is an orchestra playing music all night long recommended by doctors and to block their snoring of course but then at the end of the day what you have is like a complete dystopian collapse and um and basically it doesn't go anywhere so people start installing their little you know showers in their toilets and um and try to cook in the wash basin or whatever <laughs> I just think that all these things are amazing, but the moment we place a human being there, we are lost. These guys are very their 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 project, their their project of pure you know, artistic journey whatsoever. They're, they have nothing to do with real life, thank God. I mean if they were I kind of would regret the life of the people who would be supposed to um, use them for their real practical needs. So good I'm not in architecture. For many years I've been fighting to find a less ephemeral form for performance art. And I think this is a bit of a, you know, a momentum where it arrives to the point where performance art takes a shape of um, a shell or a, a cover for a body and that is quite fundamental fundamental to my practice because i've never tried this before and i never realized this is doable at all so the moment we've been drawing it and sketching it and working on engineering it and whatsoever i still wouldn't believe it, it will eventually work so it's a pure excitement and happiness to see that it, not only it works but also some people bring their own ideas and energies and kind of they they all you know um mix together at the end of the day to to my pure excitement so i don't know it, it's it is you know performance art is being considered as something that only exists in the eyes of someone who sees the act the act of performative sort of do it making and then in this case we see it i mean i can see other bodies performing and i don't i'm not really spoiled um and i haven't seen that much of it in my life so it's a pure you know delight and and a real real satisfaction what's interesting is that Fyodor's work evolves from performance into object and the object is a performance in a sense as well as being the shell and then it evolves further by putting it in the design museum and actually we come at it from the opposite direction that Fyodor starts with art and moves to object we start with design and in this sense move towards art and there's a it's a, there's an overlap so boundaries are blurred that's where the energy is um, and I was going to say, I'm very comfortable with that, although paradoxically, I'm, I'm not as comfortable <laughs> as I might be sitting in here. And I think good art, good design actually makes you think about things like comfort, functionality, expression, and how we behave in, with and in certain situations. I mean, this is coercive, putting it too strongly, but it, it makes me think about my relationship to a chair and how the design of a chair makes me behave in a certain way and what functionalism actually is or what it means. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with it. Design is, by definition, collaborative and it's transformative. So 
Metamorphosis is one way of looking at it, but design has the capacity to transform our experience of the world, often to solve problems. But design also involves critical thinking and speculative thinking. And that's where it, there's an intersectionality with what Theodore's doing. I mean, this is a subversion of functionalism, but it also puts into sharp relief what functionalism is. I mean, design has always been porous. Um, and, and this is an institution where we can use design as a way of looking at the world and we can use the museum as a way of showcasing design. This fits in a funny way in that, but at the same time, it also reflects on the kind of, uh, this is a critical analysis of what design is. Theodore's critiquing what functional product design is, I think. And I think it is um, quite important that Tim is a person who started Marina Abramovich's retrospective at the Royal Academy, being an artistic director of the institution. And then now look at the show there and then and then coming here tim brought a huge experience in the visual art which does not exist without design as in design doesn't exist without visual art so i think it is what we're seeing here is this beautiful melting port with ai weiwei who was here just before and now with with this small show but i really believe that this is an important sort of conclusion that many of the museum lovers in london can make at the end of the day, thinking that there is no such a thing as a boundary. There is just one big, beautiful thing around them. It's interesting because it sits in the museological context of the design museum. But if you look at the context of actually what else is on now, anti-furniture is one of the projects, perhaps the most animating project of all in the building. But there is a major show looking at emerging fashion in London for the last 30 years. There's a skateboard design show that's about to open. There's a a uh, display around low carbon uh, housing solutions. And then there is the engaged, interactive, critical analysis of functionalism and furniture here. So that's another context too, where it's part of a program of many, many things. And of course, design is many, many things. It's all pervasive.